Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the mystifying cloud infrastructure attacks. And the background to this is an attack that looks something like this. This would be a typical classic on-premises attack. This is actually like a red team that we did like way, way back. And like, to be honest, most of the attacks that I investigate, I'm a forensic investigator at TrueSec, they look something like this. And it's pretty often that it's the on-premises environment that's hit. But the question is, what does it look like when it's in the cloud? And that's what we're going to try to figure out today and draw that kind of map that we saw for an on-premises classic environment, you know, owning the mainframe, whatever attack, uh, but for the cloud. So first thing, we have some bad news. There are no cloud. But jokes aside, of course, we are going to talk about the platform and all of the things around it. So we have the web APIs, and we have like all the different functions that are sort of standardized, which means that it's actually kind of relevant to talk about this kind of thing. So we're going to dig into an attack. And all parts that we're going to talk about is something that we actually seen in real attacks. Um, if you recognize something here, then be, don't be worried, because it's several different attacks that I try to put together in a good way. So uh, yeah, we don't leak actual attack data here. But key point is, these are real attacks. So hopefully, that will give us something and see what our threat actors are actually doing when they're attacking the cloud. So this all starts with a single factor logon. We all know we should, should probably not have a cloud account with single factor. We look at the device. It's actually a login from an enrolled device. It's in the EDR. And you know they changed the user password. So I guess we can all go and drink beer now. Case closed, right? Um, yeah. One thing that you should add, and one thing that you love as a forensic investigator, is timestamps. So if we actually look at the timestamps where this happened, we see that the password reset was the first thing that happened. After that, there was a device enrolled. And then you have the single factor logon, and we didn't really cover. But a typical technique that we see is security information, which I think is a kind of an interesting persistence technique. So when you do like a self-service um, self password reset in Azure, for example, then you have these different factors that you can use to do that, and that is something that we see that I don't think it's a very simple technique, right, to keep access to an account that we don't talk about. And the password reset, that was what it started with, right? So I guess we should start with figuring out how did that password reset happen. And you see that the password reset was made on this account, which is blacked out, but the user that made the password reset is an account called sync underscore. And that leads us to a hybrid setup. So that would be a service account that we'll go into more later. But before we do that, we need to just figure out what is hybrid cloud environments and what different setups do environments uh, sorry, enterprises use in that situation. So you have federated, which is uh, what we're going to go through soon, but you can use ADFS or Okta and so on. You might have seen an ADFS server. And you have password authentication, and then you have hash sync. So if we start with federation, what happens is basically that the user goes to the federated app. They say that no go to Azure Active Directory, which, by the way, is called Entra ID now. But as long as Microsoft keep using Azure AD in their own documentation, I'm going to say Azure and mix it up myself. Uh, we see what it's called uh, after the talk. So yes, it says, no, you cannot go here. You need to go to ADFS. So ADFS checks with Active Directory and sees, is this a legitimate account? And they say, yep, it is. And then um, ADFS signs a token. And that token is given then to enter ID, and it's passed back, and it gives an uh, applic application-specific token which finally you can give then to the uh, federated app, and they say, lovely to see you again. So that's sort of the flow. And what you saw here is that we have this kind of trust, chain of trust. So what happens if the threat actor compromises and becomes local admin on the ADF server? Well, we have, for example, a golden SAML situation. So the threat actor can steal the token signing certificate and the private key, as well as another key that they need. And then they can create their own tokens. Because if you have that secret and signing certificate, then you're the ADFS server. 
but that doesn't really fit what we saw, right? This is no password reset. This would just give you a valid token and we just fly by everything. So let's move on to the next one. We have password authentication, which is that you go to AD and it puts the logon to the queue. And then AD Connect is polling the new logon attempts. And after a while, it's going to find it and it checks is this a legitimate logon attempt. If it is, then it's going to send basically a bool to Enter ID. And that is kind of a problem because if you own the AD Connect server, that means that you can patch that login W function. Uh, there is actually like known tools that does this, like PTA Spy from AAD Internals, which is um, that toolkit is really great in general. But point is, if you own that server, you can send something else instead of um, what's supposed to be there, right? So you can write your own function that says, if the password is banana, then return true and let the user in. So still, that doesn't fit exactly what we saw in the attack. So let's move on to the third variant, which is password hash sync. And what happens is that the AD Connect syncs all the hashes from Active Directory. And it gets all the hashes. And in Azure, it actually hashes them one more time and adds a salt. And it stores it there, right? So at that point, they have all the hashes, even if they're like not the same anti-hashes that were anti-LM hashes that we used to see in um, normal Active Directory. But it still has a hash that it can compute based on the password, which means that it's able to log in the user. And if we think about like what is needed for this to work, and this probably is going to fit the scenario. So we have to start with an account that starts with the msol name, which is an account that can do AD sync. It's an interesting uh, ladder movement, but that would be more of an on-premise kind of thing, right? Then we have this service account that runs the actual service, and then we have a, an account in Azure. And that account is really interesting because it has privileges to reset passwords naturally, because otherwise it can't sync hashes. We're going to look into that more, but essentially what you need to do here if you have a local admin on the AD Connect server is that you need to grab the uh, MDF file where this encrypted data is stored, which contains the clear text password of that sync account. And that is actually encrypted with DP API encryption, which if you're just running in the context of the service account, you can just decrypt it. It's like a reversible encryption, pretty much, right? So if you do this, you're going to see something like this in, if you have an EDR running on the system. So this is a clue more on our investigation here that they might have done this. And if you check again, we see, yeah, it's actually that sync account. And that is the on-premises directory synchronization account, which is responsible for in this customer's environment to sync the accounts. And this account is interesting because it has quite high privileges by default. It has this role, which is not a like role that you can actually assign to an account, but it's kind of an internal role in Azure. And it does not only have reset password capabilities, but it also has a bunch of other very interesting capabilities. So this is actually a good example of how we see privilege escalation happening in Azure Active Directory. And if you take this as an example of that, you can see that if you have this account and you have this owner's update, so you can update the owner of an enterprise application, then you can find enterprise applications which have interesting permissions delegated to it. So for example, this backup enterprise app would need to, because it's a backup solution, so it's pretty much have access to everything. But on top of that, it also has this directory privilege, which means that if the um, sync account is used to take over the enterprise app, they can then escalate and create, well, first they create an application secret, right? But then they can use that permission to make themselves domain admin. Or sorry, <laughs> global admin, obviously. You hear that I'm coming from uh, yeah, old school things on-prem, right? Anyways, uh, before we move on, that app secret thing is actually also a really interesting persistence technique that we've seen in some cases. So it's kind of um, like the at the first like instinct, you might check for newly registered enterprise applications, but the threat actor don't need to register a new application if they can just add a secret to an existing application. And aside from like the audit log when it happens, which you have like you know, 90 days or something by default, um, once that is gone, there's really no place to see those secrets. 
you can with the API actually export it out and get like a creation date and so on, but it's like really easy to miss. So it's a quite a good persistence technique for Azure Active Directory. And of course, as we saw in that graph, the last step would be to add the user to global admins, right? So, I mean, I guess this makes sense. Um, one thing though, you saw that the device was enrolled, right? Um, so that's kind of weird. Uh, it turns out that in this case, the threat actor figured that it would be more stealthy to log on with a compliant device. So they enrolled it in Intune, which means that it pushed out an EDR agent to the threat actor's machine. So if you're more interested into this, my colleague Hassan has a full talk where he just walks through the entire threat actor's timeline. Uh, and of course, you know what I mean, they used it for multiple other attacks and so on. So, yeah, uh, that backfired a bit on them, I guess. So if we go back to the graph that we talked about in the beginning, we see that we have something like this, right? So you have a threat actor that's local admin on the AD Connect server that syncs all the hashes and so on, but they were able to extract the service account that's responsible to sync hashes that also has privileges to take over applications, which they did, generated an application secret, then made their own user global admin, and of course then exfiltrate data and so on, which we haven't really covered, but yeah, it's not that interesting to see a bunch of downloads, right? The next thing is how did they get access to the AD Connect server? And when we look in the logs, we see traces from a internal Jenkins server, and I see Jenkins uh, yeah, you know, time after time doing incident response. Um, I'm the kind of person that goes to companies that have suffered from an uh, attack. When I talk to my colleagues that work with securing CICD pipelines, they say, nah, it's not that common with Jenkins. And I don't know if there's a correlation with that, but I think there's a lot of companies that aren't really doing things the right way, and they are locked into a bunch of uh, plugins and things like that with the Jenkins server that has kept growing over the years. And yeah, it's a, they have a hard time maintaining it, and we see that as something that threat actors really like, those Jenkins servers, and we're going to see why soon. So Jenkins has a script console. If you have the administrator permission, you can actually like just execute code as a feature on the underlying system, and it's going to execute as the same account as running the server, naturally, or like the service. So it's not great if someone takes over, because then they also take over the underlying system. But on top of that, they don't need to execute code if they just want secrets. So you can like dump out all the secrets that you have access to uh, with your account. And that's what we saw in this case. So we carved like, the file system, and we found this deleted file, which contained like a dump of pretty much all the credentials to a bunch of different systems. And that is naturally not a great situation. The thing here is that most of these credentials led to not the Azure environment, but the GCP environment, which means that we're going to soon jump into GCP instead of, or Google Cloud instead of Azure. But before we do that, we also saw that there was a rat running on the Jenkins server, and it tunneled the traffic through Gmail. And I think it's a kind of an interesting thing. I talked to my old colleague, Stefan. He said, yeah, yeah, this is like 10 years old. Uh, and I think he's right. But I think this is something that we see in attacks. And there's an interesting caveat with this that we're going to see soon. Um, we're going to see why this is genius and why this is not that genius. But before we do that, let's just understand how this works. So it checks any new draft, any new draft, any new draft, and uses the Google APIs to do so. After a while, the threat actor creates a draft, and it contains like a command. It's a bit simplified, obviously. And next time they say any draft, it's going to say, yes, there's a draft. And it executes a command. Then it adds an attachment to the draft, uh, which the threat actor then, through that Gmail account, can download. Right. So this is really smart, because from if you're just looking at the network traffic, you're just going to see traffic going to the legitimate Google APIs. right? So that's if you have a really big environment, that's going to melt in really good. Uh, we've seen, I'm talking about Gmail here, but we've also seen Dropbox used this way. We've seen like a Slack integration used this way. And there's a bunch of different uh, variants of this. And also from the other side, we're kind of blind, right? So 
that is why this is smart, especially like if you're legitimately using Google services or if you're legitimately using uh, Dropbox or uh, any service and they're using the same infrastructure to melt in. But why isn't this that smart? Well, if you're going to do this, you need to have the credentials to the Gmail account on the compromised system. So before you go into evil ideas that, yeah, let's hack the threat actor's Gmail account, I would advise you strongly not to do that for several reasons. The first reason is that it's probably not the threat actor's Gmail account. It's probably an account that they have hacked, so you're probably then hacking into someone's innocent account. And there's a bunch of other reasons uh, aside from the legal reasons, but the main reason, I think, is that these service providers really hate it when people abuse their services, which means that if you provide them evidence of this going on, they are able on their side work and find all of the threat actors' accounts that they're using probably, and then they can shut down their entire infrastructure that they're using. So you have a much, much ef more efficient way to work than trying to be a cowboy and logging in uh, just because you can, right? So that's the C2. So next question would be, how did I get to the Jenkins server? And what we see in the Jenkins access logs is that there are logons from the container network. So that's not a great setup, obviously, but someone at some point figured that these containers that are like running the build jobs on the Jenkins server needs access to internet and a bunch of internal different things, and it put it on the, like, the Docker default network and gave it way more network access than they realized, which means that they can access the web service uh, or like the web UI and API for Jenkins. So let's look into first how did they compromise that container. So we're going to give a few examples of how we've seen containers being compromised. One of them is an interesting uh, entry in this log, which is that it downloads a package which has like an internal name, version 99999. And some of you might recognize this as this is something called dependency confusion. So what you're doing is that if you find the name of an internal package that they're using, they are probably hosting that in an internal uh, PyPy repo, and they're using this like extra index URL parameter to pip, which means that it's going to check there, and if there's like the newer version is on the public, it's going to download the newer version because you want the latest or you want version over something. So if there's a namespace or like a name collision here, it's going to go to the latest version, which is obviously going to be version 9999. And this is old, as many of things I'm going to talk about today, but this is used because this is apparently a feature. So what they said is basically use index URL instead, because this is meant to use both sources. But in reality, not a lot of companies want to clone the entire PyPy repo, right? So they are cheating a bit, and they're using this extra URL. Plus. This is interesting because back in the day, there's no CVE for this, but just like a few years ago, this actually defaulted to HTTP. And the problem is that some Docker images are bundled with very old versions of PIP. So we saw this fairly recently, that the threat actor had managed to compromise network infrastructure in the middle, and then they just swapped out the package that's what's going to be delivered. Because it, what, what would happen is that it makes this HTTP request, and PyPy, since you know, several years ago, replies that I don't talk HTTP, so it upgrades to HTTPS. But what we saw was that it did that for every package, but then all of a sudden it replied, oh, here's your package on port, four, port 80. So they just basically sent the wrong package, right? And I think this is yeah, yet another problem with PIP, that it, uh, there's no CV, so the uh, image creators or whatever don't know that they cannot use that old version. So another way that we see this happening is if someone gets access to the source code repository, then the uh, build files and so on might be uh, in the, no, next to the source code, basically. And you know it would look something like this, so you can just change and swap whatever you want to. Uh, usually, a lot of secrets would be mounted into the uh, container as yes, like environment variables and so on. Those you can't really print because it's going to be censored. But if you just basically foreign code them and print them, then it's all fine, and then you can you know decode it on your own after. So. Finally, we also have a third option, which is shared runners, which I think is interesting. So 
many organizations are very good with protecting their like protected branches and so on, but they also have this vacation summer worker uh, repo, and all of them are going to build on the same server. So if that person or someone who can just create a job that's going to build on the build server uh, are able to push whatever they want there, they could compromise that and then they can just sit around and wait for the interesting job to come around and pull the environment secrets continuously. In this specific case, what we saw was that we have this weird commit, and what it did was change the requirements file, and it replaced a legitimate package with a package that was hosted on GitHub. And if you diff the legitimate package and this package, you see that it's only one file that changed, and it's the setup pi file. So in that file, it was just starting this reverse shell, right? And as part of the build pipeline, you have this pip or install requirements file. Uh, so of course, this would then execute in the container. So we add another line to our graph here, and we see that this all originated from this GitLab repo. So there are a few things that we still need to figure out here, right? Um, one of them is, of course, how did they get access to that account in GitLab, which is hosted in Google Cloud? And the other part would be that just because you can reach the Jenkins server over the network, you wouldn't just be administrator all of a sudden, right? You need to first be able to log into that Jenkins server uh, and get those credentials. So let's start with the credentials. Um, what they were able to find in that first time they ran in the container was credentials to be able to SSH into a machine in GCP. And the question is, what do you do when you compromise one machine in GCP? Well, in GCP, they have this amazing default setting, which is to use the default service account. That is a service account that has read access to buckets, among other things. So if you are able to execute code and you root on a GCP machine. You can use this like metadata thing to check out how it's configured and what service account it's configured to use. And by the way, this isn't really uh, unique to GCP. Querying metadata from cloud machines is something I think all, uh, if we have like app hackers here, uh, know about. It's a typical thing, right? Uh, usually what you need is that you need to be able to set an HTTP header, then you're querying this uh, address from a machine and you're going to get back metadata. In many cases, it's also badly configured, so this metadata actually contains secrets. But uh, in this case, we're only using it to figure out what uh, account is used. Um, that secret that we can extract there, that would be oftentimes limited if they have restricted it down and uh, like the token that is on the system might not have the full access even though the actual service account has the full access. But there's another way that we also seen, which is that they look for cloud uh, command line secrets. So if you uh, ever used a, you know, AVS CLI or AZ or um, G Cloud, whatever all of them are called, you notice that you do like an init in the beginning, something is probably created on your system, and then you're sort of magically logged in all the time, right? So what happens is basically that it stores your credentials in some folder like here we see in um, yeah, I can see the username of, for obvious reasons. But it's stored in your user folder if it's a Linux system. If it's Windows, it's something app data roaming, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's usually just stored like in a SQLite database. Um, and that would look something like this. So of course, like if you root on a system, eventually, if you're lucky, someone has been on that system running commands against the cloud. Maybe it's because they have like VPCs that only um, makes it possible to request those APIs from the specific server. It can be many different reasons for using those tools on a uh, cloud resource. But point is, they're able to extract that if they own that server. And you know, if we circle back to like where I come from, the Windows and the Enterprise Active Directory environments, we have this problem where if they compromise one system, everything is in the same tier, and then they're able to extract credentials, they're able to extract LSA secrets and hashes, whatever, and then they can jump to the next machine. They repeat the process, they jump to the next one. And that's why I think this is very interesting, because we see 
kind of exactly the same thing here in Google Cloud. So they're able to extract these um, tokens, in this case, that has the set metadata uh, privilege, and they're able to add their SSH key to that metadata. That is like under the hood if you run Geek Cloud, uh, I think it's like compute, SSH, and then the name, blah, blah, blah. It's going to add your SSH key and create a user account with the name of your current uh, session. And you know, if they have that, even if it's whitelisted, maybe they'll be able to just add their own IP, uh, the source IP that they have, and jump to the next one. And once they're on that machine, they're going to just start repeating the process, right? So if we add this all together, and you think about like this kind of big GCP environment, and they were able to access this like test server that was maybe using this default service account. All of a sudden, they can read a bunch of buckets. One of those buckets contained backups from other machines. They download those, and they get a new set of credentials. They're able to jump to another machine. They dump the credentials there and jump to the next one and next one. You get the point, right? So. This is actually how they found that account in Jenkins eventually that had the administer permission. So the um, flow that we have right now is basically someone is inside the GitHub for some reason. We're going to look into that soon. They're able to run arbitrary code in containers on the Jenkins server, which is this big single machine Jenkins server. And they're able to reach the network, then getting the credentials from Google Cloud. They're able to execute code in the Jenkins console. And from there, they're able to jump into Azure, which was the final goal of this operation. So let's go into MFA, because of course, this customer had MFA on GitLab. And this is, I'm talking about GitLab now, but I think it's uh, even more interesting, actually, if you look at like GitHub, because what we see is that people feel that GitLab is a social network, and I already have this personal GitLab, uh, sorry, GitHub account, so they're using that to access also their enterprise stuff, which means that when their kid downloads this sketchy crack, they get a info stealer, and all of a sudden, they steal all those uh, credentials. And the enterprise, GitLab or GitHub or whatever, is then compromised. So this is actually kind of a big thing, these info stealers. We see a lot of attacks starting with those. And there's a bunch of different uh, branches of them. Uh, Redline is a big one. We also have like raccoon stealer and so on. And what they tend to focus on is a bunch of different things, but one of them would be browser secrets. They also steal like, uh, you know, um, like Bitcoin wallet, blah, 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 right? And they steal a bunch of different things. Key point is why we call them info stealers is that they just steal a bunch of secrets and some of them even delete themselves after. And then they publish all of these to like these websites, for example, RussianMarkets.to, and there's like Amigos Market, and there's a bunch of different sites that just sells credentials and cookies. Um, so, in this case, let's look into browser secrets, because that's what they would have needed to steal, right, to be able to access this. So, cookies is interesting. This is nothing new at, um, either, right? Cookies have been stolen for quite some time. Uh, they should be encrypted, but this is like almost single line how to dump Chrome and all the cookies, because Chrome needs to load all the secrets. They are encrypted the same way that that um, AD Connect secret with DP API, which means that if you're running in the user context, you basically just do an unprotect, and then you have the secrets. So, I mean, in this case, you just start Chrome in the bug mode, so you're able to talk to it through a web socket, and then you just ask for the cookies, because the cookies are in Chrome already. Um, another way we're not that great at protecting cookies is our Office apps, by the way. Um, Mr. Docs uh, found this, and it's a super duper lead way to do it. You do a memory dump, and then you just grep for the token, and that's it. Because of course it needs that token in memory, right? So it's fairly easy to be able, if you compromise a machine, to then be able to also compromise the cloud account of that machine. And that is, um, you know, depressing in a sense, but. There are some things that we're doing to make this a bit harder. Uh, one of them would be that it's actually pretty good uh, Azure at detecting this kind of thing. So it would be like an anonymous token usage because like the token has traveled to another destination or like another source. 
Um, on top of that, we have some secrets, and with Windows 11, uh, we have these TPM requirements, which is used to, among other things, store the primary refresh token in the TPM. So if you're not using TPM, it's super easy to just dump the primary refresh token of your Azure account, which means that your account is well, not in a good state. But if you use TPM, um, there is at least no way I know that you can extract the secret there. So that would be sort of the attack, right? So we have this other party that are running these info stealer operations. They're selling the credentials, which the threat actor then use buy to get the cookie, jump into a GitLab server, and from there we have all the other steps until they finally yeah, got what they were after, which was some high-value targets and their mailboxes and so on in Azure. And you remember that this um, computer was actually enrolled in the EDR, and this is an additional proof, I would say, of that. Uh, so we see them actually browsing Russian market uh, in, uh, in the EDR. So, I mean, when it comes to this, I think we have learned some things, but Coming from an on-premises and classic Active Directory thing, and we're thinking uh, Microsoft and Azure, uh, like Active Directory, something they're super, super bad, nothing is ever secure. Um, I'm kind of depressed seeing that we have sort of the same problems in the sort of new modern environment. And I think in many cases it comes back to the fact that I mean, all of us that work with IT, we usually don't have the best um, you know, people don't list, always listen, we don't have the right resources, blah, blah, blah. They prioritize getting to market instead of prioritizing uh, what we all know that they should prioritize. So, finally, we also don't really know how this machine got that stealer. It got it from this link. And before you panic and see that GitHub, a Microsoft GitHub account has been compromised, uh, which, by the way, McAfee were very quick to write on their blog. Uh, someone from Bleeping Computer found that, no, it's not compromised. It's an amazing feature in GitHub, which is that you can start a commit message, uh, or so like a comment on a commit, and you can just attach a file that's going to be hosted under the repo. And then you don't even need to post it. It's just going to stay there. So, yeah. Uh, apparently, that's a feature, so uh, if you want my slides, I took the liberty of hosting it in the official documentation on GitLab. <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, thank you. All right, thank you so much.